Hey, I'm Indy Clinton, and this is Sleep Deprived, a podcast where I dive into all the unspoken parts of life, including relationships, friendships, beauty, and motherhood. This is Life Unfiltered, Sleep Deprived and Running Off Caffeine. Welcome to Sleep Deprived. I am with the beautiful Lael. She is a parenting expert, which kind of scares me because I've never (laughs) seen a parenting expert and I don't know what we have in store for today, but thank you so much for joining Sleep Deprived. How are you? I'm really great. It's so good to be here. Thank you for coming. So I feel like there's so much to unpack being a parent. As you know, you're a mum of three yourself. Mm -hmm. How has parenting changed over the years to what you view it as now in society? Because there's obviously a lot of technology that plays a role in parenting. Mm. Has mm. it impacted parenting negatively or positively? I think both. Like I often say parenting today is, is I think, probably one of the hardest times to be a parent. Mm. And I think that's because, well, a few reasons. I think we are living pretty stressed lives. Like we've got a lot of balls in the air. We've got financial pressures, all those kind of things. But I also think we've got this whole other expectation that we put on ourselves. So because of social media and because of the internet, which is amazing on some levels, Mm. I think we are also now comparing ourselves to what other people look like, how they're doing it. And I think that adds a a kind of subtle subconscious pressure to how we think we should do it and how we should be. Mm. So I I feel today, the parents that I work with today, I feel like are are probably some of the most stressed parents I've ever Mm. worked with because I think we've got a bit of this hustle mentality that we've got to do this and we've got to do that and we've got to make sure our kids play soccer and they've got to play the piano and we've got to all these things, these pressures of we don't want our kids to miss out and how do we be the best parent we are. Mm. And I I think it's, it's adding an extra pressure and it's really tricky. So I have so much compassion for parents these days because I think it's really hard. Yeah, it Mm. is hard. And we're just chatting about how it's funny because what I post on social media is my parenting and I show the chaotic moments. But And people love, a lot of parents can relate to that. And is it because they can relate and they love it because they feel less Mm. lonely? Yeah. Is it, do you think? I think there is so much merit in sharing Mm. the hard bits. And I think, um, I mean, I run um, groups of parents online and one of the things that um, is the most powerful for a lot of them is hearing other people's stories. And so when someone's like, my child wouldn't brush their teeth and then they wouldn't get in the car and then, you know, and everyone's like, yes, that's me, I get it. And I think parenting can feel really isolating and lonely because we're doing it in our own little houses or by ourselves. And actually we're not meant to be doing it like that. You know, the whole idea of of parenting is that we're meant to have a village around us and we often don't. You know, we don't, for some families they don't have grandparents or they don't have anyone close by that they can call on if they need And sometimes we live in places we don't even know our neighbours either. And so we're doing it kind of on our own in our own little houses and that can feel really, really isolating. So I think that's why when we see people online being real, it helps us go, okay, yeah, this is, you know, it's not just me. I, you know, I'm, I'm not a train wreck of a parent or I, Mm. I'm, I'm, I don't have it together. I don't think many people have it together. I think we're all doing the best job we know how with what we've got. And I think... We've got to be super compassionate. I mean, that's so one of my really big messages is we've got to be compassionate to ourselves as parents because it's one of the most full-on jobs that you do as it a human. It is, and it's not validated, I feel, in today's society. Being a parent and being a stay-at-home mum or dad, whatever you are, it's not validated. It's not really seen yeah. as a job or work, yeah. even though I think, I mean, now, and you would know having a, a job and being a parent, mm-hmm. I think for me being a parent is way harder. It is. Like 100%. I would much rather go and have a day in an office or yes. a day doing work yes. than being at home with three young yes. kids. I used to feel like that all the time <laughs> when my kids were little. I'm like, I couldn't even go to the toilet on my own. And I used to be so jealous of my husband mm-hmm. who would go to work and I'm like, you get to go get a coffee, you get to go to the toilet by yourself, you get to sit there and look out the window and think about things and meanwhile I'm at home with all the balls in the air. And and I think you're right, It's it's parenting is one of the most undervalued jobs but it is one of the most important and mm. I think 
what is really important for us as parents is to really own and just acknowledge this is a huge thing that I'm doing and this season of my life, particularly when you're raising little kids, is an intense mm. one. It's really labour intensive. I say to parents it's not always going to be like this. It is going to get easier as our kids grow and they, you know, they develop a bit more and, you know, those milestones where they get to unbuckle their seatbelt by themselves yeah. or they can get food if they want it. Like all those beautiful steps make it a little bit easier but there is no doubt that this job of parenting particularly in our culture is not valued for what it should be because it's one of the most important jobs you're raising the next generation yeah and I completely agree but it's really hard I guess for parents because there is no village like we spoke about yeah how do how do parents find that village or create that village because I thought like when I had a baby that the village would be knocking on my door yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but they didn't knock on that door they got lost <laughs> yes. they did not find my door they, they did not find come. my house yeah so I really had to create that village and I had to I guess step out of my comfort zone and join yeah. a mother's a mother's yeah. group and yeah. I met some girlfriends there and then you kind of wish to for your kid to start preschool because you know there'll be mm. more mums and yeah. more friends you make and you yeah. you see these mums on social media and they're constantly going to wineries or having yeah. margarita nights yeah. and I'm like I can't wait for that but yeah, right yeah. now I'm in the trenches. Yeah, you are. Um, yeah. So th- where can mums find that village? Yeah. Well, I think sometimes online is a beautiful thing. You know, mm. sometimes you can join groups or people that are like-minded parents and and some of the parents I work with, some of the most beautiful connections they've found online, which is really beautiful. Mm. But I think things like joining a mother's group and, and then when our kids start, kinder and school, stuff like that. I mean, I, I was a young mum, much like what mm. you were, and I none of my friends had kids for like another five or six years after I had my children. So I felt really lost, like who is my tribe here? I mean, sometimes I'd be at a park and I'd go, oh, that mum looks cool. And I'd kind of walk up to her and go, hey, how are you going? <laughs> it was like I was hitting on another mum just to find a Literally friend. me. Because I was really like, oh, I just want to talk to someone about how's it going with you with sleep and what's yeah. this food thing like? And, and and I think we really deeply need that. And then I often say to mums, if you can find just one or two like-minded friends who are mums and, and you kind of feel like you've got the same philosophies and values mm. like that that can be so golden just to help you get through you know these these tricky years mm. and it is hard and I think also what I'm kind of navigating now is you meet these amazing mums and you grow up with them but your kids aren't the same mm. and that I think creates hardships in friendships mm. and with your kids because they're all different they all like different things you love the mum you get along mm. but when one kid or your kid starts acting out and doing different things. How do you kind of navigate that when everyone's parenting is different but you love the person? Yes. How do you navigate different parenting when I guess you don't want your kid to be exposed to that? Yeah. It's a really um, tricky thing and I think it's a it's a delicate space because, as you say, we love someone but it doesn't mean we're going to parent the same way Mm. and – And I have found over the years, you know, a lot of clients have shared with me that often their their friendship groups do change because they find someone who does kind of parent in similar ways and it's just easier to be together because you're all kind of on the same page. Uh, I often find though if you have someone that you dearly love but it feels tricky with Mm. the kids is try and make times where you can catch up without the kids, Mm. right? Or knowing that it can be tricky with the kids and sometimes what the catch-ups are, are you being really close to the kids like as in when they're playing, being part of their play so you can help navigate any stuff that comes up because like any humans, kids also have, you know, tension with other kids. You know, they all have their own beautiful little personalities and I think in an ideal world we would love to go, oh, we'll have a cup of tea and the kids will just play idyllically over there on the floor. (laughs) It doesn't happen like that. No. Does it? Some days it does and we're like, oh, this is magical. <laughs> but a lot of the time it doesn't and I think that's tricky and I think we sometimes need to set everybody up to win, which means if we know that there's some tension with the kids, you know, do we need to be in part of their play or help facilitate it a bit more so that, you know, everyone's getting their needs met or perhaps we just do, hey, let's go catch up together or, you know, something where we can actually just connect because it's so important for mums to have that connection time as well. Mm. So mm. you would recommend rather than I know, I think the old school, I guess, idea was they can figure it out themselves. Leave mm. them, they'll figure it out them, mm. themselves. Do you recommend that or would you recommend, I guess, sitting down, being on their level, understanding what's going on, mm. being mm. present? Yeah. I think children, particularly when they're little, need help, right? Yeah, okay. Because... 
they're still learning how to be in the world. You know, when we look at little kids under the age of seven, their prefrontal cortex, which is that rational kind of thinking part of their brain, isn't fully developed yet. So mm. so when they see a truck, they're going to go and pick it up and they're like, that's my truck. And yeah. then another kid's like, no, but that's mine. And in their world, they're like, no. And then we come in and go, you should share. And this child's like, no way, I'm not sharing. <laughs> yeah. Now that is fair enough, right? Because in that little three-year-old's mind, they're like, this is my truck. I own it now. <laughs> like, this is mine. Mm. And they're still learning about all those beautiful nuances about being in relationship and and how to navigate stuff so I feel and I totally get that the old school way of they'll figure it out Mm. but I think our children do need support and help and I also think too you know little kids have got big feelings a lot of the time like that's that's what you know fuels their day a lot of the time because Mm. they're frustrated around things or perhaps you know they've had a big fright or they're scared and they've got all those tensions in their body and it's going to come out in another way they need us to be close and around and attuned to help them process those feelings in healthy ways so then they don't take it out on other kids so I really do believe that you know, our job as parents is to stay attuned to our kids, which means that I often talk about it like when you see your little one, you kind of do a little bit of a scan of them to go, how are they today? Are they in mm. balance? Like are they feeling pretty calm in their bodies, their nervous system calm? Are they listening? You know, is there eye contact? Are they chatting? You know, they're pretty in balance or are they out of balance, which is where, you know, they're going up and they're pinching their brother or mm. they're just, I don't want the red cup, I want the blue one. Like you can just see when they're off. And when our kids are out of balance, it really is a bit of a, a sign for us to kind of move in a bit closer. I imagine it like our kids are standing there waving a red flag going, mm. I'm having a hard time, I've got something on board and I kind of need an adult who is grounded and centred to help me navigate what's here and help me move through it. Yeah. And could those triggers do you think, I mean, I find that with my son Navy, sometimes he wakes up and nothing's triggered him but he's mm-hmm. just yeah. in a grumpy mood. Don't yeah. follow me. Like this morning, doesn't want his little sister following him yeah. around, doesn't want her sitting next to him on the couch. Yeah. He sits in her way. He just yeah. he's very yeah. confrontational yeah. when yeah. he wants to be. Yeah. I don't know what triggers that. You had a great sleep. What's yeah. going on? Is yeah. it because I've got yeah. three little kids and I have to navigate my love right now yeah. to each of you? Yeah. Sometimes yeah. it's quite hard to kind of pick up on those triggers. Yeah. yeah. Do you think it could be, I've read a lot and done some research, the television? Look, I think there's many factors that at play. Look, how your son's like four. Three and, three and, half, and a half, yeah. Nearly four. Okay, so for three and a half year old, I often look at them and go, okay, they have this beautiful little body mm. full of lots of stuff going on. Mm. And yes, they had a great sleep, but they may wake up and all of a sudden, as you say, they might be like, ah, there's Not- two younger <laughs> sisters here that I have to compete with, right? And that feels really heavy for me today. Now, he doesn't have the words necessarily to articulate that yet. So they do it through behaviour. You mm. know, behaviour is always communicating something. And when we're seeing him be like, I want space or he's he's a little bit, you know, antsy or a bit fractious, really I think what he might be needing is a bit of connection, right? Oh, and that yeah. might be you go over and you scoop him up and you snuggle into him and go, I haven't given you 500 kisses today. I need to start mm. now. And in those moments you give him kisses and he giggles and you feel a bit of connection and you might watch him just kind of drop a little bit mm. and go, okay, I feel better. Or, you know, it could be that sometimes when kids are a bit like that, what they do need is they need to have a big cry to kind of let out those feelings so that they can kind of come back into balance again. So there's many factors that can contribute to it. Mm. But I also think technology can play a huge part, you know, because what happens particularly for little kiddos is when they are on screens all the time, what happens is they kind of go into a bit of a numbing state, right? Mm. I mean, we do that too with phones. We just sit there and we're like totally checked out. And... And what happens when they're doing that is, yeah, they might be quiet, but they're usually kind of a bit disassociated, right? And yeah. so what happens is then when we take the iPad away or turn the television off or something like that, then how they're feeling often then comes to the surface again. And that's why sometimes when we say no more iPad or you have to get off the phone, that children will get angry, mm. right? Now we love to blame it on technology. And yes, technology has got a whole lot of complications with it. But in my world, how I see it is it's not so much the technology, it's kind of the feeling feelings that might be sitting there underneath and the technology kind of numbs it for a bit and then we take the technology away and then you know yeah. we're, we're angry again it's a bit like the equivalent of us like let's just say we're feeling upset or we've got a whole you know something's going on and we drink a whole bottle of wine right and while <laughs> we're drinking the wine we're like yeah this is great and i feel good right <laughs> and then when that white wears off we're like oh Here's all the heaviness again, yeah. right? It's still there. And technology can play that role for us, you know, whether we're kids or adults as well. Yeah, wow. I know. And I, I do find technology has its goodness, but 
some parts of technology can be so negative. I find more recently I've cut out YouTube. Mm. I don't know why, but YouTube just kind of hits something in my son's Mm. brain that just tweaks him. And I don't, it's something about, I don't really like him watching other kids play. I think Mm. that's really weird. I'm like, you have this amazing garden. You've got toys. Something about my kids, they do not play with their toys. They play with the garden hose. They play with everything but a toy, which I quite like because I think I would describe myself as I don't know. If I was had to if I had to label myself, I would be maybe a a free range parent but mm-hmm. with boundaries, you know, yeah. that my kids yeah. know that the no means no, yeah. Yeah. which I think is a great yeah. thing, but also with free range comes a lot of accidents, trial yes. and error, yeah. and I'm a strong believer that's that makes a kid a kid. They need to learn, they yeah. need to know. Yeah. But a lot of other parents and some of my friends, they yeah. would never Yeah their kids have never been stung by bees or burnt by the stovetop yeah. or put their yeah. finger in a toaster or things like that. Yeah. yeah. What are your thoughts on the different types of parenting these days? Are you are parents becoming more, I guess, helicopter parents and wrapping mm. their kids up in cotton wool? I think we have become really risk adverse, yes. Mm. I think um, we have moved into this uh, overprotection of our kids on some level. Now, of course, we need to keep our kids safe as a standard, but mm. I think – we have moved into a way of being where we're like, I don't want them to feel anything bad and I don't Mm. want them anything hard to happen to them. And the reality is our kids are going to have hard no matter what, Mm. right? We can, you know, send them to the right schools or we make sure they only eat this food and, you know, we kind of orchestrate everything that they do. But there is still going to be a child they go to school with that's going to say something mean to them Mm. or they're not going to be the best on the basketball team or they are going to fall off the top of the monkey bars at some point. We cannot foolproof everything and we're not actually meant to because when our children um, don't experience a bit of adversity or don't experience hard things they don't then get to develop the muscle of resilience Mm. resilience is so important as humans Mm. and it doesn't mean that we say to our kids yeah go play with that bee's nest over there right (laughs) we're of course we're being safe and careful but our children need to learn the capacities of their body and Mm. they do that by climbing trees and stretching and being in mud and falling over, right? They learn how their body works and what they can do. And so often what we do is we go, be careful, be Mm. careful, be careful. And actually what we want to do is we want to change that messaging to um, trust your body. What can your body do? Mm. Does that feel like a good choice? Like really inviting them to tune into themselves to expand what they need to. I mean, I, I look back at my son who's now 24 and as a little kid, if there was something to climb on, that's what he did. Like yeah. climbing on the back of the couch, jumping off. Oh, he was like Spider-Man. He just like <laughs> – and um, and I remember so clearly when he was about five or six, my younger brother took him to the skate park. He was going to teach him how to skateboard. And we're at this skate park and, you know, there's those massive bowls that they drop into. <laughs> and there's my brother with my little five-year-old on a skateboard and he's like, okay, now drop in. And I'm standing there going <gasps> – like I was like yelling. I was like, no. And then they did a few times times and my brother walks over to me calmly and he's like you need to leave and I'm like why and he's like you're gonna make him crash with Mm. fear and I was like yeah you're actually right and I was like all right I'm gonna trust you know (laughs) and so I left and my brother had him and he skated and now my son is one of the most amazing rock climbers right he wow always uses his body in really amazing ways like that has been part of who he is he trusts his body Mm. and I think from when he was little I just went I have to give you opportunities to use your body in ways that feel great take risks so you can know your limits and and do it and he always says that's one of the best things that's ever happened for him because he learned to trust that and learn to trust his body. So I think it is so natural for us as parents to want to keep our kids safe. That is our job, right? Mm. And I absolutely get the fear that sits there. But we want to give our kids opportunity to take risks, to um, be in situations where things maybe don't go their way and then they have to learn how to navigate it. Mm. And our job as a parent is not to jump in and fix it. Our job is to sit beside them and say, gosh, that sounds hard. Mm. You know, tell me more. How can we navigate it? You know, what did that feel like for you? Because when a child goes through something hard, if they've got a safe person to take it to, they Mm. get to express the feelings around what happened to them and then let it out then they'll actually move on and thrive that's resilience right that's where we develop the muscle of i can do hard things Mm. you know i I didn't get picked in the basketball team but it's okay right or i fell off the monkey bars there what would i do different next time Mm. right and that's how we grow and learn and i think as adults too 
one of my big messages is always this. We have to model to our kiddos about taking risks, about stepping out of our comfort zone. If we want our kids to do it, they have to see yeah. us do it because our kids are always watching. Yeah, right? they are. Our, our kids can't be what they can't see. So I often say, who do you want your child to be in the world? You know, if you want them to be a beautiful, empathetic being, mm. then we have to be empathetic to them. We have to model what it looks like to be in a hard situation and, and have empathy and compassion. Or mm. if we want our children to know how to process their anger, then we have to model what healthy anger looks like, right? Yeah. So we might feel angry and our child kind of comes up to us and goes, are you okay? And the best response we can have is, I'm actually really angry um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to go outside and I'm going to yell at the trees or <laughs> I'm going to rip up some paper or I'm going to put on some music and do some angry dancing and I'm going to shake it out. And in that moment they are watching you move your feelings in a healthy way mm. so that when they're angry they're like, Mama, I need to angry dance, right, <laughs> or I need to throw something. Or and, and, again, this is not just with anger but it's like with sadness, it's with taking risks, it's with making mistakes. Mm. Our kids are constantly watching and I think as – as parents, our job is to really come back to, well, what do we want for our beautiful kiddos and are we actually living that? Yeah, and it's so true. Kids really are sponges and they really take, they see you, I don't, they see you act towards your partner. Yeah. One thing about me is I'm very good at saying sorry to my kids if mm. I react because mm. as a parent you can't expect your kids to be on their best behaviour 24-7 and yeah. I find a lot of parents get caught up in that and they they want their kids to be that. There's this high expectation and at the end of the day they're little three-year-olds. You forget that they're these little kids that are only just yeah. kind of they are what you've made them, you know. So when I yell or I get angry or mm -hmm. I'm frustrated or I take something out on them, I'm always like, I'm so sorry, mum, you yes. shouldn't have done that. Just yes. like you, I get frustrated yes. too, Beautiful. which is – I, I think I learned that reading a book, but I would have never thought growing up that an adult would ever apologize to their child until yeah. I became a parent. Yes. I'm like, there's no other way. Like, yes. how could you not apologize yeah. to your child yeah. if you react like that? I love that you do that. It's so beautiful because you're so right. We are human mm -hmm. and we make mistakes all the time. And there is no perfect in parenting. There is no perfect. Mm -hmm. I have done some amazing things as a parent and I've also messed up with, in all the ways, right? Mm -hmm. And I think what you just explained there, India, is so beautiful is is that, that we, when we make a mistake, we model repair. We mm. model, I am really sorry and, and is there anything I can do to repair with you? And they might be like, I need a cuddle and you're yeah. really beautiful. Because, again, they're watching that and then they're able to see it. A and you're really right. You know, our generation of parents or our grandparents – that apologising for what they did was not necessarily no. something that was very normal. You know, owning their behaviour wasn't something that was a common thing. So, mm -hmm. again, it's it's a stretch for us. We, you know, we often parent the way we were parented and some of that is good and some of it's not so great. Mm -hmm. and, and as we become parents, we have the opportunity to change the bits that don't feel good and to do it, you know, do it in a way that – that again is going to imprint or impact our kids with with what we want. Yeah. And do you find parents who you chat to are often impacted still by their parents or grandparents? I know it's great to take, I guess, a grain of salt from everyone, but yeah. sometimes when the grandparents' advice or their opinions or how they want their grandchildren to be parented infiltrates the family dynamic, I think it can be. For example, my dad is quite an anxious grandfather. Wasn't an anxious dad, grandfather now. Like his yeah. grandkids are the apple of his eye. Yeah. So he's kind of in, instilled fear into my kids in little yeah. things, you know. Yeah. Bambi got up the other day drinking a baby Chino was around a dog. He's like, don't go near the dog in my bike. I'm yeah. like, dad, yeah. she's fine. The dog's yeah. asleep. He's not even looking at her. <laughs> Yeah, Stop yeah. instilling this yeah. fear in my yeah. kids. Yeah. How can parents navigate those yeah. anxious grandparents, anxious friends yeah. around their kids? Yeah. It's really tricky. It's really tricky. And I think um, I think what's really good to take to heart is this, is remembering that you are the biggest influence on your kids. They mm. spend the most amount of time with you. So our kids are going to be exposed to grandparents or they'll be exposed to teachers at school or stuff and there might be things that go on where you're like, oof, that's not good. But mm. I think it's important to remember that you still are that big influence. So 
in that moment, it might be like, oh, you know, dad, I can see that you're worried about Bambi. Bambi, it's okay, sweetie. Like you can just, I often would just say what I see in those moments yeah. because our kids are feeling us often as well, right? So if our vibe is like, it's chill, it's mm. okay, our kid's going to look at us and clock us and go, okay. And yeah. they're often going to go, okay, yeah, grandpa's uh, anxious. That's his bag, <laughs> right? So I think we get, our kids are constantly tuning into us to go, are you stressed about this or not? So if we can kind of stay calm and go, hey, it's all right, you know, thanks for being concerned, dad, mm. you know, I love that you look out for her, but she's okay, right? Yeah. I mean, that can be a beautiful way that you can actually do it. And I think, again, it's it's too – I know your kids are still little, but as they get older, you know, when they are in situations where someone is anxious or there's stress or whatever, it's a beautiful thing to keep tuning into them, to have a conversation and say, how did it feel for you when, when you know, Papa got really upset then, mm. right? Did that feel scary for you or – or did you feel worried? And and as you have that conversation, again, you're able to help them break it down if it does have an impact on them because you're staying attuned to them and you're talking to them about it mm. so that they can navigate, yes, that felt scary. And, and then you might say, yeah, well, Papa gets really scared that something's going to happen, but that's him. But I really trust you and I trust that how things are going. And so that's where, again, we are we're not making anyone wrong. We're just kind of giving our children information so that then they can feel and see how, how that stands. Yeah, absolutely. And they really do look look for you for, I guess, when my kids used to fall over when, they were, when Navy used to fall over when he was younger mm -hmm. and even Bambi now, I would be the crazy lady at the park yeah. clapping and cheering yeah. because they often look at you to be like, oh, my God, am I bad? okay? Like, yeah. is this bad? Yeah. And I would be like, I'm like, woohoo! That was amazing. Do that again. Yeah, yeah. Or I'd make, oh my God, did you make a hole in mm. the ground? And I mm. still do it to this yeah, day. Yeah. Because of course, if something's going to hurt, I'll always make sure I, to mm. ask, are you okay? Because yeah. I don't want to dismiss yeah. or, you know, make them not feel validated, yeah. their feelings. But yeah. often it's like a little graze. Yeah. Some mums run and, oh, my God, you need, yeah. we've got to go, you poor yeah. thing. And I'm just there clapping and cheering yeah. and people are probably looking yeah. at me and be like, this lady yeah. is yeah. a crazy parent. But yeah. I really think the kids, they thrive off it because they know it creates resilience. It's yeah. like, okay, I can yeah. get back up. It's just yeah. a graze. It's okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I do think kids yeah. these days aren't as resilient. Yeah. Um, I think it's a beautiful thing, like, really to flag that as, like, they are looking for you for that reaction and we're also bringing in that, you know, checking in. Are you okay, my love? Like, what do you need? Like, we're, you know, we're bringing both of those things together. Mm. I mean, if we were like, you're fine, yeah. <laughs> whatever, yeah, just chatting, right, then the child might be like, hey, but if we're able to just tune in and go, ah, oh, you know, that's mm. like, you fell over, you did great, What you know, that that, again, is a completely different thing. So it, it is so true, you know, I think coming back to that kids can't be what they can't see but they're also often looking for us for the cues of how to respond to stuff. So when we can be as centred as possible or we're, you know, attuned and watching, then we get to kind of set a tone as well of how yeah. it is. Mm -hmm. And I've only kind of just learnt this recently speaking to a therapist. He's like, if you're good, your kids are good. Yeah. It's not the other way around. I always used to put my kids first. I'm mm. like, my kids are my number one priority. And then mm. it's me. And he goes, no, 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 you got to change that. Your happiness is mm. the most important and then mm. everything will fall into place. Yes. And it's so I true. Because yeah. Yeah. it's a lot of parents, a lot of mums I know put their kids mm. first, put their kids' yeah. needs first. Yeah. And then before yeah. you know it, it's like yeah. when was the last time I've ever done anything for yes. myself? And I think this kind of circles back a bit to how we were raised, right? Mm. Because most of us grew up in environments where we watched, say, the mother figure in our life, you know, many mothers were really selfless and they were just putting everyone else's needs first, you know, eating last, never having any self-care. Like one of the questions I used to ask to, to parents is what was modelled to you around good self-care? And mm. people were like, nothing. Maybe my mum played tennis on Thursdays for like an hour. That was it, right? Yeah. Um, but they never saw them take care of themselves, right? Mm. And then and then I would often say, and did you grow up in an environment where there was like this subtle passive-aggressive vibe? Mm. Because quite rightly women were just giving, giving, giving and and then finally they'd reach a tipping point and it would kind of come out in these subtle ways, right? Mm. Whereas what you're saying is so true. We have to take care of our needs so we can be the parent we want to be. Mm. But I think the thing that's really tricky is we we often have a pretty messy imprint around self-care. And I see this with a lot of the women I've spoken to that when I say, what would it look like for you to take time for yourself and meet your needs? The number one response is I feel guilty. Mm. Yeah. Or yeah. I don't have time or I can't afford it. And all those things are very valid as well. Mm. But so often we can carry a story that because of what was modeled to us that 
taking care of ourselves and meeting our own needs is selfish Mm. and it actually is the opposite. Everybody wins when you take care of you because not only are you filling up your cup so you can be the kind of calm, playful mama you want to be, you're also modelling to your kids about taking care of yourself and that is one of the most important imprints we can give our kids Yeah, because we want our kids to grow up to go, hey, I'm feeling really tired, my body needs to rest or gosh, my social battery is really low, I need to actually just have some time for myself. And again, they're watching to see what that looks like. And for me, that totally changed. Like when I had my daughters, I really, it dawned on me, I'm like, who they are going to be in the world is based on me as a Mm. woman. And what am I teaching them? And up until then, I had no self-care, was really crap at it. You know, Mm. I had this story that if I take care of myself, it means I'm lazy, I should be able to do everything all the time. You know, and a bit like this, if my kids are happy, it means I'm a good mum. And actually that's not true at all. You know, my kids are allowed to be angry and upset. Their happiness doesn't equate to whether I'm doing a good job or not. No, exactly. They're going to go like this with their feelings and that's very normal. So the work is to take care of me so I can turn up and be, I use the word spacious, spacious Mm. for my kids so that I can be playful or I can listen to their feelings or I can attune to them to see where they're at. But that doesn't happen unless we get our own needs met. And it's so, I love that you were talking about this. It's so important because for me, I so want this next generation of parents to come through to go, need to meet my needs first so then I can meet my kids. Yeah. And I didn't know the importance of that until I started speaking to a therapist. Mm. I I truly believed my kids come first in Mm. everything. But once I've kind of, even this week, changing that I come first, going for a walk, even Mm. last night, Navy always likes to put the guilt on me. I don't know how, but, you know, he's been at daycare all day and I had a plan to walk with a friend, take the dog for a walk. And I'm like, okay, here's your dinner. I've made you bolognese. Talk to daddy, watch some TV, yeah. have your dinner. I'll be back in an hour. He goes, but why are you leaving? I haven't yeah. seen you all day. Yeah. And I'm like, do not say that. I was like, Navy, you like yeah. mommy to be happy. I'm doing something for myself. You know, yes. exercising makes me happy. Yeah. I've just spent bloody three hours with you all afternoon yes. taking a bike ride. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's tricky. And look, it's understandable for little ones. You know, they are like, hey, I need to feel you, right? Mm. And so even when you have like done two or three hours of filling up their cup, mm. you know, there's they're, often it's very normal for them to go, I want more. Yeah. But I love that you're like, actually, you're with daddy. You know, he's your other parent. He loves you. (laughs) You know, he's going to take care of you. I'm going to do this for me. And then when I come back, we can connect. Yeah. And I think, you know, so often with kids, it's what they deeply want is our presence, right? Mm -hmm. They want us to look them in the eye. They want us to not be on our phones or making a cup of tea, like to be really present with them. And I often say to parents, I know we are all very time poor, but 10 or 15 minutes of like, present time where you yeah. actually are just tuned into them does wonders for them because they feel that connection yeah and then they're like ah there's my parent that feels good mm. and I think whenever you've got kiddos that are siblings that are fighting a lot or kids are you know having a hard time then increasing that kind of one-on-one special connected time does wonders for meeting their needs as well mm. and and again you can also say to him you know sweetie when I get back we're going to do 15 minutes of whatever you want to do yeah now he might want to wrestle on the bed and you're like awesome we're going to come back and wrestle yeah or do you want to read books together or do you want to build lego or do you want to jump on the trampoline and he knows that you're going to come back and he's going to have that connection time with you yeah. and it's also you know I feel for your little guy being the oldest and he's got two little ones as well you know mm. it's often very common for the oldest there's a fight for your attention and so it makes sense that even though he's spent time with you you. he's like but I need more yeah you know? it's like he, it was quite cute because I picked him up yesterday on the electric bike and he loves that and we never do it often and then we rode around we checked the surf we pulled over we had a picnic Beautiful. we I'm like okay we got to start heading home it's yeah. almost 4 30 and yeah. he's like no no I don't want to I don't yeah. want it to end I'm like but yeah. maybe your sister's coming you know it's yeah. that balancing yeah. the love and I'm like your, yeah. your little sister's coming home from yes. kindy yes. I gotta see her then I'm yeah. trying to fit in a walk yeah. and then be yeah. back to put you to bed it's very hard and I think in those moments though so my big thing is when he's going, no, I want more, mm. you know, we can often jump into justifying, but we've got to do da 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 mm. and And one of the things I find that's really helpful for kids is just acknowledging you want more time with me, darling. Yeah. It's hard when you have to share mummy, isn't it? Yeah. Now he might 
all of a sudden his bottom lip might drop and he might start crying. That's not mm. a bad thing. He's just like, oh, it feels heavy having yeah. to share you. And he might need to just have a beautiful release and you give him a cuddle and and then he's been heard in the frustration of it. Mm. And I think that's one of the trickiest parts of parenting is, you know, when we've got all the balls in the air and then our kids are kind of pushing up on something, we jump straight into fixing or kind of saying, yeah, but da 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 and, and, you know, I found over the years when we can just – you know, acknowledge you want more of this, don't you, darling? Or mm. that is really hard. Something happens in their little bodies because they're like, oh, yeah, you get it. You yeah. get that I do. It doesn't mean you give him more because you can't, yeah. but you're like, I just, I see that this is hard. And that that's makes such a massive difference because yeah. it's the same with us as adults. If you've had a really hard day parenting with your kids at home and your husband comes or your partner comes home, it's like, how's your day? And you're like, ah, da, 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 da. If he just jumps into, well, tomorrow what you should do is get your mum to come over and you should do this and you should do that. Like what happens? We just get really like. Totally. You just want to be seen. You just want someone to go, oh, darling, you're doing a really good job. Mm. Like it's really hard. I so appreciate, you know, what you do with the kids, right? Because mm. instantly we go, okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah, you I feel better. Me. I feel better. And and I think that's one of the beautiful things that we can learn to do with our kiddos is just to acknowledge what is there for them it's such a, an important thing it is and it's mm. such a, a navigation for the parent because every child is different so mm. you know navy is so emotional he he loves he's you know he loves us both but he's you know very close to me yeah. he wants touch he wants cuddles he wants to yeah. sleep in my bed yeah. he wants 24 7 but then I've got Bambi and she's not affectionate at yeah. all but she's quite she's a hard shell, so mm. you have to push, push, push. And then mm. nighttime, just before she's about to drift off, she wants you mm. to touch her head. Mm, yeah. So you have to really, I guess, pick up on their cues mm. and what they like in order to fill yeah. their cup up, yeah. which is yeah. hard because then you also have to work on your relationship and yourself <laughs> and this. I'm like, what the fuck? Yeah, How yeah. does everyone have it's, all this time? It's <laughs> why it's intense, right? Because mm. you've got three little people's needs, you've got a relationship, you've got your own needs. It's full on. Mm. It's really full on. And I think that's where... We have to have compassion with ourselves, right? Because we're, we're really good at beating ourselves up when we mm. think we're getting it wrong or we have a day where we yelled. I mean, everybody does that at some point. We're all human. Yeah. And I think it's at those points where we are stressed and we're at those tipping points. We have to ask the questions, all right, what do I need here so I can come back into balance for myself? And maybe that is a break. Maybe it is just some extra support or maybe, you know, some of our buttons are being pushed from the way we were raised or our mm. past stuff's turning up. It's not easy at all. And I think when you want to parent your kids consciously, like I really hear that you are like, I these little people are so important and mm. I want to do it well, it adds another layer on top of it as well, right? <laughs> and and that's what's tricky. It's really hard. Mm. And and again, I think what I have found is if we beat ourselves up, then all we're doing is adding extra stress and extra pressure and another negative voice. We have to take a deep breath and just go, I'm doing the best I can. You know, what is also going to support me so I can support these little people? And some days it'll be magical and amazing mm. and it'll hum. And other days you're like, it was a shit show from the moment we woke up. Yeah. Right? And luckily each day is a new day, right, and we kind of reset and we do it again. But I think it's really important that we we give ourselves that compassion because parenting is exactly as you said right at the beginning, one of the hardest jobs that we do. Going to work yeah. is often easy. Like mm. getting to work is the hard bit. But yeah. Yeah, work, leaving the house. Work's great, right? Yeah. But it's, it really is. And I say this often, when you have little kids under five, you are doing the hard yards, mm. right? It is one of the most intense periods of parenting and and it's kind of why you've got to hold on tight with your relationship as well because it will change and it will open up. But it definitely is um, it definitely is a big time. Mm. And you mentioned it's so important, which I've also read, having that 10, 15 minutes, put your phone away. Mm -hmm. It's so easy to quickly just check your phone. It buzzes. Who, who needs mm -hmm. me? And that, mm -hmm. that child picks up on that, I yes. guess, that you just constantly doing that. They just want yeah. your full attention. Yeah. I find myself, I want to play with him, but I also want to create an independent child, mm. you know, someone that he can use his imagination because mm. from the get-go he was my firstborn, so I was very on with him. And then the more kids I had, I had to share my love and not be as present with him, not go down the slippery slides at the mm. park and not be that mum that literally plays with him, gets mm. on the swing. Mm. How do I create that independent child without mm. feeling guilty because I know you need yeah. them to be bored, right? Yeah, yeah. 
boredom's a really important thing because I think that's where imagination stems from. Mm. It's where creative play often happens. But it also is quite common for a child if there's other siblings that they're like, I want more of your mm. presence and time. And I think one of the beautiful things that you can do is is just prioritise on that connected special time so that you, you know, if you have to do something, you've got to make dinner or you've got to be with a baby or whatever, you say to Navy, hey, I've got 15 minutes, what do you want to do? Mm. And so, again, you don't look at your phone and for that 15 minutes you play, you laugh, you giggle, you kind of meet his need for connection. Mm. And then you say when the timer goes off, and now, darling, I've got to go make dinner or now I'm going to go get the baby and he might protest and that's okay, right? Mm. And that kind of boundary that they sometimes push up against there is an opportunity for them to offload some feelings if mm. there's something going on. So that's not a bad thing, even though it can feel like, oh, God, why are you getting upset? You know, for me, I really trust that children know what they need to do to come back into balance and sometimes mm. they push up against boundaries and have a big cry so their nervous system gets to reset and they get to kind of come back online. Mm. So I think, you know, when we are seeing behaviour like that where he's like, I want more, I want more or he's, he's like, I want you to play with me, when we can really make that kind of condensed time of like, hey, we've got 15 minutes, we're going to do it and setting a time is a good idea so when the timer yeah. goes off it acts as a bit of a boundary mm -hmm. for him to either push up against but also so you know, you know what, I've done that 15 minutes, I've been really present and now I'm going to do the other thing. Yeah. As we start practising and doing it, then kids begin to get into the habit of going, yeah, that's what happens, right? So mm. I will get my needs met, I will get my time and then it often creates some more space. Now, again, you might then go and be with a baby and he still might be hanging around and he still might be like, but I want more. And you're like, remember, sweetie, I'm just being here now. You can go and play outside if you want because our kids will be guided when we're really clear on it. So yeah. if we are kind of in the space where we're like, oh, maybe I should give him some more or mm. we're really wishy-washy, he's feeling, oh, yeah, no, there's wiggle room yeah. now with <laughs> mum, right? Whereas if we can go, my love, there's 15 minutes here, we've done it, I'm going to be I'm gonna be over here now um, and we hold it clearly, even though we might have to try it a few times, he will then eventually go, oh, okay, I can go and do this over here. Yeah. Right? And, again, he's still, he's little, he's still learning, right? So yeah. it, it's a lot of repetition and a lot of practice for them to be able to go and do what they need to do within it and then as your other kiddos get bigger right mm. then they'll all play together and yeah. then all the other different pieces but you know often it can be big for the oldest one you mm. know because he did have you all to himself and then two other little people came along and he was <laughs> like I had no say in this and who said that that was a good idea right so I might have some feelings about this yeah totally okay. it's so okay and yeah. it's funny because him and the middle child who's a Bambi 18 months mm. they really clash and he loves his baby sister yeah. like he's obsessed yeah. but I, I obviously I know it's an age thing whereas yes. she takes his thing she fights yes. back she pinches yeah. there's quite yeah. a lot of tension at the yes. moment and it's really it's sad because he often wants to just yeah. hold baby soul yeah. wants to be with soul yeah. just want, I'm like soul can't even play like yeah, you've yeah. got Bambi yeah. but I, I do think as they get older and they realize wow you're actually mm. a lot of fun he'll yes. love that and he's Sometimes it's just time and mm. sometimes it's the age. And, and I often say too, you know, there can often be a bit of beef between the, old, the older two because mm. firstly it was Navy and then Bambi came along and he was like, hey, <laughs> you're the one that's caused the hurt if I don't have <laughs> mum and dad to myself. But then by the time Soul's come along, he's like, oh, I already know what this is like. Yeah. Right? So it's, it's not uncommon for the oldest and the youngest to uh. bond in that way and then the beautiful middle child has their own story yeah. that they <laughs> play out with that. But, but, but it, it does change as they get older, you know. Know, and so, you know, again, these years where there's a lot of navigating and, you know, refereeing and all that kind of stuff as they develop and as they grow, it definitely can shift. But, yeah, it's big. I feel for little ones. I mean, you I look know. at them and you're like, oh, this is such a big time for you. You know, it's huge. And, they're still learning and, and it's growing. so hard to, I guess, explain to them what's going on in yeah. child language. Yeah. And yeah. sometimes I find it so hard, just like you said, all they need is just a cuddle or a yeah. kiss, all that present time just yeah. to fill up their yeah. cup. Because yeah. it is hard trying to fill up all your kids' cups yes. when you've got so many kids and so many yeah. young ones. And yeah. then you feel guilty. The constant mum yes. guilt is playing on your mind. Oh my yes. God, I didn't spend enough time with her today. Yes. Or did I spend yes. enough time with him? Yes. It and is. I think that's where, you know, and I think that's where if we can just break it down for ourselves a bit and go, it's not about spending six hours being really present with our kids. Mm -hmm. It's not, right? Because when children are little, 
their job is to play. That's mm. how they learn. That's their job, right? It's not our job necessarily to play with them for six hours. You know, we can be doing stuff alongside of them. You know, we're folding washing and we're making dinner and we're doing stuff whilst they are playing. And then we might drop in for some play and then we yeah. come back. But I think to appease that mum guilt, if we can make sure, you know, I'm going to give just 20 minutes now of real presence, yeah. then you're like, I have given some of that connection, right? And it yeah. might be when Bambi and Sol are asleep and you might just do it with Navy then, you're like, right, full presence there, not looking at my phone. And then you might have another moment with Bambi where that's met in that way. And yeah. I think that can appease the guilt for us when we know that we're actually spending just some quality time with them yeah. one-on-one and and we're present. And we know when we're present. I mean, there's yeah. many times where, you know, my kids be like, can you play with me? And I'll be like, yeah. And I'm playing trains <laughs> and I'm thinking about the email I have to send. I could put tomatoes <laughs> on the shopping list. And totally. I am like 100% not there. And yeah. they feel it. Mm. But when you are there and you are like. You're so intrigued at in that, that Lego tower. Yeah. And you're looking at their kind of cute little nose yes. and their ears. And you know when you look at them and you're like, my God, you're so delicious. Mm-hmm. They feel that. And that's that's what they're often searching for. They're, they're searching for that beautiful, present person that's seeing them, right? Yeah. And that's what makes their nervous system go, oh, I feel safe. This feels mm. good, right? And that's what helps them again navigate, you know, life. Yeah. Oh, my God, it makes me just want to go home and go play with them. Yeah, that's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> and what mm. would your, your top three tips be in creating a resilient child in this mm. world we live in today? Yeah. Well, I would say definitely allowing our kids to take risks, Mm -hmm. right? So trying out for the choir, even if they can't sing, or, you know, (laughs) it's like trying out for the basketball team. It's about risky play. It's about all those kind of things. So making sure that you give them the opportunity to take risks. The second thing I think which builds resilience is really teaching and inviting them to feel their feelings which Mm -hmm. means knowing it's really safe to cry Mm -hmm. it's really okay to get angry and that you are a safe place to come when they're upset because Mm -hmm. the biggest part of resilience as I kind of mentioned before is having a safe person to go to to express the hard to express the upset to express the disappointment Mm. so we want to keep working on having a beautiful relationship where they know hey this mum is the person I can come to and you know this starts when they're little because I often say when I talk to parents of teenagers you know you want to be the parent that when your your teenagers are at a party and something's gone down that their first thought is I'll ring my mum or I'll ring my dad they'll know what to do Mm. you don't want their thought to be god I hope my parents don't find out yeah right now a lot of that comes from building this beautiful connection when they're little of listening to their feelings, letting them know it's okay to feel sad and let it out, you know, let when they're angry, modelling again, healthy way for them to move their feelings. So again, we're creating that safety of um, connection so that when things are hard, they know. So mm. we want to help them take risks. We want to create that um, beautiful safety so they can, you know, they can let it out. And, and I think the third thing when it kind of comes to resilience of, you know, helping them, you know, know that they can take risks is again just modeling, modeling it within us. Yeah. Right. The way we want them to be. And again, which also means us taking risks or stepping out of our comfort zone or or them seeing us do hard things because they're always watching. You mm. know, so it might be like, you know, even as your kids get older and you're like, I've got to go do this interview and I'm really nervous. Like mm. speak that. Yeah. Let them see that you're nervous and then you go do it and go, I did it. Mm. And they're like, well done, mum. You yeah. know, like, you know, and even as they get older too, I mean, so much go- gorgeousness happens when we have dinner together and we have these conversations mm. and you talk about what was the hardest part of your day and what was the best part of your day and where, what was the biggest fail of your day and all those things where they get to see, hey, being human is messy yeah. and we're all imperfect and the more that we can be that and model that, the more our children are going to have permission to do the same. Yeah. That's amazing. Well, we have a few people. Well, usually people call in to leave us a few questions, but my phone line is down. Okay. So I'm pretty sure we have people that have written in questions. Okay. Question number one, how can I handle my child's moods? Oh, very good. Okay. Well, the first thing I would look at is we want to look behind the behavior, right? So the first thing is often kind of clocking ourselves because when our kid walks into the room and they're, you know, they're really antsy or there's something going on, mm. I so know that often the thought in our head is, oh, what now, right? Mm. Oh, God, what's going to happen? Or why is he upset now? And actually what we want to do is we want to get curious instead. We want to mm. be like, okay, there's always a reason for the behavior. What's going on here? So yeah. I often say... 
there's kind of three reasons why kids get upset. You know, the first one is because there's a need that hasn't been met and that is like they need a cuddle, they need food, they need to go to sleep. Like we, they're, they're frustrated trying to build this Lego and they can't get this piece on top and we help mm. them and then they feel better, right? So the first thing is often, you know, is there a need that needs to be met? The second thing we often look at is when our kids are out of balance is, you know, is there information that they often need? So for some kiddos they have a really high need for information and I often say it's kind of it's it's the kids that are like this what time are we going and who's going to be there and how long will we stay for and are there going to be <laughs> snacks and when are we coming home and what are we going to do when we get home and they all they need all the information and the answers to feel safe and mm. so for some kids not all kids what they really need is information so when we're seeing a bit of a mood we're kind of tuning into is there something that they need here information wise mm. to help them feel safe but then the third reason why kids can often have big feelings is because it's like a build up feelings of stress or trauma from just their day yeah. or stuff that's gone on in the past that's being activated. And so when we, you know, it's why I was saying when our kids walk into the room, we kind of want to scan them to go, where are they? Are they in balance or are they out of balance? Mm. And if we're feeling that they're out of balance, we as a parent want to get curious and go, I wonder what's going on there. There's a reason why, there's always a reason for the behaviour. Yeah. So in that moment, it's our job to resource ourselves enough to go, what my child needs here is a calm adult to come in close and be curious about what's going on. Yeah. So when your child's got this big mood, we want to come in and say sometimes one of the best things we can do is come in and be playful yeah. and just be like, oh, I feel like there's some, you know, something going on here and all of a sudden we be like, oh, I think you haven't walked upside down today, have you? You know, and you might <laughs> yeah, them up yeah. and all of a sudden you're holding them upside down and they're giggling and they're laughing yeah. and that bit of connection has just shifted what's needed, yeah. right? Other times it might be just coming in really gently and softly and going, what's going on, mate? you know, mm. and they might be able to articulate it. And then other times we actually just need a boundary or a limit where we come in and we're like, you know, they might be have a big mood and they start to take it on their sister and we get in there and we go, I'm not willing for you to hurt your sister, mate, and I'm here and you hold a boundary and you let them be able to push up against you to offload the feelings that are sitting there because that mood is usually just a whole lot of stresses and tensions there that need to come out and the way that it often comes out is through crying or through raging, can also happen through laughing and they get it out and then they come back into balance. Hmm. And I think we have to remember that particularly for kiddos under the age of seven, you know, they can't walk into the room and go, mum, I'm feeling very stressed today. There's a new uh, teacher at care and I don't like her and that feels really full on and, and I still find it hard separating from you for the day. And mm. and then you went and had two little babies and I'm also really still grappling with what that means for mm. me. And like a four-year-old or three-year-old's not going to say that, no, right? Because exactly. they don't even quite get that yet. Mm. It It is their behaviour that is showing. And so our job is to be curious about the behaviour and to kind of come in gently and be that really calm anchor to help them move whatever's there. Yeah. And and I swear over all the years of doing this work, I 100% believe kids know what they need to do to come back into balance. Mm. We often just get in the way. So mm. if your child runs into the room and all of a sudden they're like a dog who's got zoomies and they run around <laughs> the room and they're like this, right, you're like there's some energy in their body they need to move, mm. right. And so often we're like stop doing that. Whereas yeah. actually like you need to move. Come on, let's do it. Mm. Make an obstacle course. Or let's go outside. Run faster. Jump. Mm. Move. Right. We're really they're showing us in that moment. Oh, I've got all this stuff in my body. I need to do that. Yeah. Right. Or they go up and pick a fight with their their sibling. You're like, yep. You get in there and go. They need a limit to push up against to move what's going on. So it's our job to be tuned in and be really curious. Like if if I could see behind what's happening, what do I think might be happening, and how do I move in to help facilitate what they need? Yeah. That's very long answer to your question. No, so. that was very insightful. <laughs> Amazing. Question number two. Tips on going from two to three kids. I'm due in September. How can I make my kids feel less neglected? Mm, it's so big. And isn't that's it? how I feel 24-7. Yeah. I'm neglecting yeah. one of them. Yeah. So I think a great thing to do when a new baby's coming is lots of preparation. So reading books about a new baby's coming is really great. Playing babies is really great. Mm. Children process life through play. Yeah. So getting babies that they can wear in a carrier, you know, or we play what babies, you know, we're playing having a baby. Again, depending on the age of your kids. Mm. Um, play is a beautiful way to do it. I would also um, make sure, like we talked about say lots of special time and connection time leading up to it. And then you know when the baby actually comes again it's about 
like so much of what the goal we've talked about today is how do we support ourselves so we can be there for the kids, which means little pockets of special time with them. Mm. It's getting some support to come in and, you know, make dinner for you and do your washing and, and be with the baby so you can, you know, do bath time if that's what mm. you want to do. It's, it is a juggle. There is no doubt there's a juggle. And, and what I really do believe is this, is that our kids can be quite resilient. So mm. even though we are like, oh gosh, how am I doing this to them? Ryan, bringing another person into the family and that's going to make it harder. You're also giving them the gift of a sibling, which is going to be amazing, you know, as they grow. Mm. But in those early parts, it's, I think it's about doing the best job we know how of those, those little connection times of listening to their feelings of being attuned to them in the best way that we can. Mm. And as you know, I know your littlest one, you know, still little, those first few months are intense, yeah. right? They're so intense and we're just doing the best we can. And it's at those times we call in the support if we can. You know, we're not meant to be doing it on our own. So no. say yes to all the support. Mm. When someone says, can I help you? You go, yes, 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 yes you can do my washing. Make yes, me food. You can make me food. <laughs> yes, you can take the older kids to the yes. park. Yes, you can come and hold my baby while I sleep. Just yes. Like we're meant to have no, the support around us. It's so easy to say us. no, isn't it? Oh, we're very good at saying no. I'm so we're good like, at saying oh, no. I've got it together. I'm a hero. <laughs> but yes, totally. But actually, if I could make one thing happen, it would be that every mother when she has a baby has a postpartum doula come mm. to her house and nourish her, massage her, love on her, mm. cook some food, clean the house, be with the older kids, like mother the mother so that mum can then recover and be, you know, um, get rest so then she can actually be you know, yeah, where she needs to be. The, but we just don't have the support and we so, so deeply need that. I know because then you rely on your partner but the partner's handling the older two and then you're yeah. like, who do I have? I'm just yes. here yeah. leaking milk all over the yes. sheets, yes. laying in wet sheets with yeah. a baby that yeah. constantly wants me and needs yeah. me. Yeah. It it's is so hard. Big. But yeah. thank you so much for joining mm -hmm. Sleep Deprived today. I honestly Pleasure. appreciate all your wisdom. Mm -hmm. I have a lot to take home. Mm -hmm. a lot to unpack I, I feel like I need to go home and do that 15 minutes of presence with each child so I've got Beautiful. 45 minutes of play clock good 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 <laughs> thank you so much mm -hmm. for joining Pleasure. us today thanks Lael. for having me thank mm -hmm. you